Chapter 6 Ephesus The Worship of Man Condemned Although the councils were convened by the emperors, one of the most obvious characteristics of the councils was their theological independence. The state was never permitted to dictate to the church, and the resolute independence of the orthodox theologians was beyond question. And, although later theological vitality passed to the West, the early preeminence of the East was marked. One of the persistent humanistic demands of the Church was for the worship of man. Emperor worship had been, of course, man worship, but in a broader sense, all humanism is man worship, and this was the basic faith of antiquity. Some of the attacks on Christians sought to destroy Christianity's God-ordained faith by insisting that the church too was humanistic and worshipped a man, Jesus. Why then, it was held, should the church take a position of hostility to the empire and to emperor worship? In a Syriac document on the martyrdom of a deacon, Habib, the governor raised the issue when Habib refused to offer sacrifice to the official cult. Quote, the governor said, How is it that thou worshippest and honourest a man, but refusest to worship and honour Zeus there? Habib said, I worship not a man, because the scripture teaches me, quote, Cursed is everyone who putteth this trust in man, end quote, but God, who took upon him a body and became a man, him do I worship and glorify, end quote. Every attempt was also made to insinuate man worship into the church. With God the Son having become incarnate, it was a point of attack for the humanists to use Jesus Christ as the vehicle for man-worship. By several means, this humanism was insinuated into the church, but the basic strategy resolved itself into two forms. First, the deity of Jesus Christ could be denied, as Arianism did, and yet the worship of Christ could be insisted on. This meant plainly that a man, Jesus, was being worshipped, not God the Son. Second, it was held that Jesus was not literally God incarnate, but a man who had effected a union of wills with God, so that he was one with God. For this position, Jesus was one with God, not by birth and nature, but by moral will, so that a deification of the creature had taken place. The Third Ecumenical Council, the Council of Ephesus in AD 431, had this issue of man worship to deal with in the form of Nestorianism. Crystal summarised under three heads the apostasy of Nestorius. First, the denial of the incarnation of God the Word. Second, the worship of a human being, that is, a man named Jesus. Third, quote, degrading the Eucharist to the worship of bread and wine as Christ's humanity and to the cannibalism of eating Christ's real flesh and drinking his real blood in the rite, end quote. At the heart of these errors was the fundamental error, man-worship and the denial of Christ's deity. According to Burkhoff, quote, Instead of blending the two natures into a single self-consciousness, Nestorianism places them alongside of each other with nothing more than a moral and sympathetic union between them. The man Christ was not God, but God-bearer, Theophorus, a possessor of the Godhead. Christ is worshipped, not because he is God, but because God is in him. End quote. For an Astorius, according to Landon, quote, the word was indeed united to man, but was not made man. Christ was not born of the Virgin and never suffered death. End quote. In 428, Nestorius had become Patriarch of Constantinople. Nestorius had immediately tried to earn a reputation as a zealous defender of the faith by persecuting the previously condemned forms of Arianism and other heresies while dealing very cordially with Pelagians. The church historian Socrates Scholasticus and did not believe that Nestorius actually, quote, denied the divinity of Christ, end quote, but saw him as rather an ignorant and ambitious man, quote, for being a man of natural fluency as a speaker, he was considered well-educated, but in reality he was disgracefully illiterate, end quote. Socrates may have been right, although it is unlikely as to Nestorius' ignorance, but the fact remains that, 
Whether through ignorance or intent, Nestorius was a humanist whose basic religious motive was man-worship. That he was also close to the throne and an ambitious man adds to his basically anthropocentric perspective. The attitude of the council was one of a total rejection of creature worship, whether of the perfect man, Jesus, the Virgin Mary, an apostle, prophet or saint. The principle of creature worship was rejected in whole. The shorter letter of Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria, to Nestorius stated the position of the council, quote, For it is not true that he was first born a common man out of the Holy Virgin, and that then the word descended upon him, but being united to flesh in the womb itself, he is said to have undergone a birth in the flesh, because he claims as his own the birth of his own flesh. So we say that he both, quote, suffered, end quote, and, quote, rose again, end quote, not that the word of God suffered in his own divine nature, either the stripes or the piercings of the nails or the other wounds, for his divinity did not suffer, and that because it was without a body, but because that which had been made his own body suffered these indignities, he himself is said furthermore in that sense to have suffered those things for us. For the unsuffering word was in the suffering body, and in the same way also we understand that he died. For in his nature the word of God is immortal and incorruptible, and he is life and life-giver. But because his own body, quote, by the grace of God, end quote, as Paul said, tasted, quote, death for every man, end quote, he himself is said to have suffered that death for us, not that it belongs to his divine nature to experience death, for to say or to think that would be madness. But that's, as I have just said, his flesh tasted death. So also, again, because his flesh was raised, that resurrection is attributed to him, the word, Not that he, the word, fell under the power of corruption, God forbid, but because his body was raised again. The distinction is a vital one. If Jesus Christ be reduced to a remarkable man who united himself to God and became God in that sense, then the door is open to the redivinization of this world, its orders and the state. Then again, emperors can become gods and Great men unite themselves with divinity to become the expression of God's will for their age. The approach to God, then, is through man. Man works towards God. And the issue is not grace, God's condescension to man, but works, man's assent to God. The issue at stake was the survival of Christianity. Cyril cited the difference precisely. Quote, For the scripture hath said, Not that the word united a man's person to himself, but that he, quote, was made flesh, end quote, but, quote, the word was made flesh, end quote, means nothing other than that, like us, he took part of flesh and blood and made a body like ours, his own, and came forth out of a woman, not having cast away his being as God and his former birth out of God the Father, but he has remained even since his taking of flesh exactly what he was before. This, the doctrine of the exact faith, everywhere the faith sets forth and maintains. End quote. Nestorianism meant a total surrender of Christianity, and the Council of Ephesus was sharply aware of this. In spite of Nestorius's eminence and the imperial favour, the Council anathematized Nestorius. Prior to this action, Nestorius answered St. Cyril's letter and declared it to be insulting to him. He accused Cyril of holding, quote, that the consubstantial divinity is liable to suffering, end quote. Nestorius plainly denied the incarnation, making a distinction between the man who by moral union became one with God and so became, quote, the anointed one, end quote, and God, quote, everywhere the scripture of God when it makes mention of the Lord's incarnation, transmits to us a birth and a suffering, not of the divinity, but of the humanity or the anointed one, so that the Holy Virgin is to be called by the more accurate appellation, quote, bring her forth of the anointed one, end quote, not, quote, bring her forth of God, end quote, end quote. 
Nestorius used the term incarnation, but only to deny it. Through a misunderstanding and mistranslation, Ephesus has been seen as a defending or making possible the worship of the Virgin Mary when it actually condemned all creature worship. Theotokos has been translated as, quote, Mother of God, end quote, and Nestorius has been perversely seen as opposing the exaltation of Mary. But Theotokos, as Crystal points out, means, quote, bringer forth of God, end quote, that is, that the Virgin Mary brought forth God the Son in his incarnation. Nestorius would have made Mary simply the bringer forth of Christ, the Anointed One, a man who was to be worshipped as God. Instead of incarnation, Nestorius affirmed a conjunction or connection of God and man, and he accused his enemies of being Arians and Apollinarians, and worse, heathens, while declaring his faith was the faith of the fathers and of Scripture. Quote, it is a thing right, therefore, and worthy of the gospel transmissions to confess that the body is the temple of the divinity of the Son and a temple united by a certain lofty and divine conjunction so that the nature of the divinity appropriates to itself the things of that body. But to charge, therefore, upon that expression, appropriation, the properties also of the flesh conjoined, I mean birth and suffering and death, belongs truly, brother, to the erroneous opinions of the heathen, or the errors of Apollinaris, who was smitten in mind, and of Arius, and of a mind sick with the other heresies, or rather with whatsoever is worse than those. For it will necessarily happen that such will be hurried away by the term appropriation, and on account of that appropriation, they will make God the word a partaker in sucking the breast and a sharer in gradual growth and of the fear at the time of the suffering and one who needed angelic aid. And I will be silent as to the circumcision and sacrifice and sweatings and hunger and thirst, which things, inasmuch as they happen to his flesh for our sake, are to be joined together to be worshipped. But these statements concerning the divinity will be received as lies and will also become the cause of our just condemnation as slanderers. These are the traditions of the Holy Fathers. These are the announcements of the scriptures of God. End quote. Nestorius found it impossible to accept a literal incarnation. To believe that Mary had brought forth incarnate God and had suckled him, and that this incarnate God had been circumcised, had grown, and had shared in humanity's trials was to Nestorius offensive. To him, a moral union was the answer. Nestorius' solution to the Christological challenge is a significant one and genuinely humanistic. The initiative is reserved to man. God is passive. Man is active. It is not God who reaches down to man in the Incarnation, but man who by his works reaches a point of progress and moral achievement whereby he is in union with God. History is determined not by God, but by man by time, not by eternity. Nestorius had deposed some orthodox clerics under charges of Manichaeanism, and he now accused Cyril of being influenced by these men and by this same doctrine. In the voting on Nestorius's epistle to Cyril, the hostility of the council to Nestorius was marked. They clearly recognised his denial of orthodoxy. As Crystal noted, quote, the very essence of Christianity was involved, that is, one, the truth of the incarnation of the Word, and two, the question of serving a man, a creature, that is, the man put on by the Word, contrary to the fundamental law laid down by Christ himself in Matthew 6.10 and Luke 4.8, end quote. The long epistle of St. Cyril to Nestorius expressed the decision of the Council of Ephesus and was put into the Acts. After reviewing the creed, Cyril declared, quote, Following in all points the confessions of the Holy Fathers, which they made, the Holy Ghost speaking in them, and following the scope of their opinions, and going as it were in the royal way, we confess that the only begotten Word of God, begotten of the same substance of the Father, true God from true God, light from light, through whom all things were made, the things in heaven and the things in earth, coming down for our salvation, making himself of no reputation, 
was incarnate and made man, that is, taking flesh of the Holy Virgin, and having made it his own from the womb, he subjected himself to birth for us and came forth man from a woman without casting off that which he was. But although he assumed flesh and blood, he remained what he was, God in essence and in truth. Neither do we say that his flesh was changed into the nature of divinity, nor that the ineffable nature of the word of God was laid aside for the nature of flesh, for he is unchanged and absolutely unchangeable, being the same always according to the scriptures. For a low visible and a child in swaddling clothes, and even in the bosom of his virgin mother, he filled all creation as God, and was a fellow ruler with him who begat him. For the Godhead is without quantity and dimension, and cannot have limits. Confessing the word to be made one with the flesh according to substance, we adore one Son and Lord Jesus Christ. We do not divide the God from the man, nor separate him into parts, as though the two natures were mutually united in him only through a sharing of dignity and authority, for that is a novelty and nothing else. Neither do we give separately to the word of God the name Christ and the same name separately to a different one, born of a woman. But we know only one Christ, the word from the Father with his own flesh. End quote. Cyril not only declared the reality of the Incarnation, but he, with the Council's approval, declared the two natures to be in true union without confusion. This was asserted to be the Orthodox faith. Thus, what was more formally defined at Chalcedon had been already the Orthodox faith. Cyril went on to make it clear that Christ was not a deified man. Quote, we do not say that the word of God dwelt in him as in a common man born of the Holy Virgin, lest Christ be thought of as a God-bearing man, end quote. Rather, quote, he became flesh, end quote, was truly incarnate, though without confusion of natures. It was, quote, not as if a man had attained only such a conjunction with God as consists in a unity of dignity alone or of authority, end quote. The position of Nestorius made the worship of man the worship of God. Quote, it is horrible to say in this connection as follows, quote, The assumed as well as the assuming have the name of God, end quote. For the saying of this divides again Christ into two and puts the man separately by himself and God by himself. For this saying denies openly the unity according to which one is not worshipped in the other, nor does God exist together with the other, but Jesus Christ is considered as one, the only begotten Son, to be honoured with one adoration together with his own flesh. End quote. The doctrine taught by Nestorius supposedly preserved God's being to himself, but in actuality it made man God, because it made a man able to become God by act of will. The answer of Nestorius to the final summons of the council was to shut the door in the face of the visiting bishops and then to preach even more bluntly his particular doctrines. Theodotus, bishop of Antyra, said that Nestorius declared, quote, that we must not assert nourishing by milk in regard to God, nor the birth out of a virgin. And so he often said here that we must not say that God is two months old or three months old, end quote. For Nestorius, it was an impossibility for the passive, quote, unmoved mover, end quote, to become the active agent or to become incarnate. Man could become God, but God could not become man. The council, in reading the opinion of the church fathers, found the opinion of Nestorius clearly named as heresy. Thus, Gregory the Great of Nazianzus, in Epistle 1 to Cladonius, had written, quote, if anyone say that the man had been formed and that then God put him on, be he condemned for that he is not bringing forth of God, but of a woman, but an avoiding of being brought forth. End quote. Nestorius had both made clear that Jesus was only man by nature and also that Jesus was to be worshipped. I worship him, the man, that is Christ's humanity, who is worn. For the sake of him, God the Word who wears, I bow to him who is seen for the sake of him, God the Word who is hidden. 
God is unseparated from him, the man who appears. For that reason, I do not separate the honor of the unseparated one. I separate the natures, but I unite the bowing. End quote. But the council made it clear that only God could be worshipped. Not even Christ's humanity could be worshipped, but only his deity. The humanity of Christ is not nor ever can be deified. The two natures are without confusion, even in the unique incarnation. Nestorius held to, quote, the unmixed conjoinment of the two natures, let us worship the man co-bound to with the Almighty God in the divine conjoinment, end quote. By moral union, Christ, having become one with God through his moral excellency and works, Christ was therefore to be worshipped as God. The door was open to any man or state who, by moral excellence or works, united himself with God to be worshipped as God. In the name of defending God's honour, Nestorius usurped God's worship for man. When Hellenic humanism captured the church in the medieval period, this exaltation of man came to the fore in the church. Innocent III held that, quote, the Pope holds the place of the true God, end quote, and Marcellus in the Lateran Council, and with its full approval, called Julius, quote, God on earth, end quote. Cardinal Bellamine held that, quote, the Pope can transubstantiate sin into duty and duty into sin, end quote, thereby placing him above God and his law, also making man active and God passive. Protestant modernism has similarly demoted Jesus to an Nestorian moral union with God and thereby exalted man and itself to a position of potential union with God and actual judgment and thereby superiority over God's word. The council then approved St. Cyril's twelve anathematisms against Nestorius. The first anathema or chapter declared, quote, if anyone does not acknowledge that the Emmanuel is really God, and that therefore the Holy Virgin was bringer forth of God, for she brought forth in a fleshly way the Word, who had come out of God and been made flesh, let him be anathema. End quote. Nestorius issued a counter anathema one. Quote, if any says that he who is Emmanuel is God the Word, and not rather God with us, Matthew one two three one. That is, that he, God the Word, dwelt in that nature which is like ours, inasmuch as he was united to our lump, Romans eleven sixteen, which he took from the Virgin Mary and names the Holy Virgin, Mother of God the Word, and not rather of him who is Emmanuel, and asserts that God the Word himself was turned into flesh, which he took for the showing of his own deity, that he might be found in fashion as a man. Philip 281, let him be anathema. End quote. The second anathema stated, quote, If anyone does not acknowledge that the Word who came out of God the Father has been united by his substance to flesh, and that he is one anointed within his own flesh, that is, that the same one is both God and man together, let him be anathema. End quote. By way of answer, Nestorius tried to identify the orthodox position with Apollinarianism and Sabellianism, holding that it did, quote, infinitely and uncircumscribedly coextend flesh to the divine nature, end quote, whereas Cyril and Ephesus had made clear that there was no confusion of the two natures. The discarnate god of Nestorius was not unlike the hidden god of the Arians, the total remoteness and impossibility of such a God made it inescapable that an actual God be sought for in and of this world. Nestorius denied first the incarnation and second gave worship to the man Jesus directly and to God the Word indirectly only, that is, relatively, as Crystal has shown. Nestorius's second anathema read, quote, If anyone in that merely external conjunction of God the Word, which was made to flesh, asserts that a change of the divine essence from place to place has been made, and that flesh is capable of containing his divine nature, and that it was united to flesh in birth, or again infinitely 
and uncircumscribably coextends flesh to the divine nature to contain God and says that the very same nature is both God and man, let him be anathema, end quote. The orthodox doctrine held to the union without confusion of the two natures, a union by incarnation. Nestorius held to a moral union with a strictly discarnate separation of the two natures, but a worship and therefore tacit deification of the human nature. The third anathema of Cyril and the council declared, quote, If anyone separates the two substances in the one anointed after the union and co-joins them in a conjunction alone of dignity, that is, of authority or power, and not rather in a coming together in a nature union, let him the anathema, end quote. The Nestorian position made Christ no different than the prophets by nature, but yet the recipient of worship from man and authority from God, Nestorius' third counter-anathema stated, quote, If anyone does not say that Christ is one by a mere external conjunction, who is also Emmanuel, Emmanuel is explained in counter-anathema 1 to be a mere man, but that he is one by a nature which is made up of each of the two substances, that is, that of God the Word and that of the man taken by him, and does not at all confess that one mere external connection of a son which even now we preserve without any mingling of the two natures, let him be anathema, end quote. To Nestorius, the central offence was the incarnation, and his hostility to it is marked. The fourth anathema of Cyril declared, quote, If anyone shall divide between two persons or substances, those expressions which are contained in the evangelical and apostolical writings or which have been said concerning Christ by the saints or by himself, and shall apply some to him as to a man separate from the word of God, and shall apply others to the only word of God in the Father, on the ground that they are fit to be applied to God, let him be anathema. End quote. This anathema was aimed at attacks against the two great Alexandrian theologians, Athanasius and Cyril, and against the attacks on the councils from Nicaea to Ephesus because of their approval of the doctrine of economic appropriation. This doctrine affirmed the two natures in true union without confusion. It forbade the ascription of certain acts to Christ's humanity and others to his deity, for such an ascription would assume in alternating consciousnesses and no true union. In that true union, quote, we must economically ascribe to him God the Word, all the human names and human expressions used of that man in the New Testament, in order to guard against our being led, as were the Nestorians, to worship a mere creature, contrary to Matthew 6.10. End quote. In that the divine is the infinitely superior and controlling nature in the incarnate Son, we must economically ascribe to him the activities and words of the whole, for while God the Son was truly incarnate, the determination of all things never passed from eternity to time, nor from God to man. Athanasius made this point in his arguments against the Arians, quote, for it was fitting that the redemption should take place through none other than him who is the Lord by nature, lest, though created, that is, as new creatures in Christ, by the Son, we should name another Lord and fall into the Arian and Greek folly, serving the creature beyond the all-creating God, end quote. It would be the, quote, Greek folly, end quote, humanism, if man's salvation were primarily the work of Christ the man. By the doctrine of economic appropriation, the ultimacy of God and his sovereignty and decree were maintained. Athanasius further stated, quote, It became the Lord in putting on human flesh to put it on whole with the affections proper to it, that, as we say that the body was his own, so also we say that the affections of the body were proper to him alone, though they did not touch him according to his Godhead. If then the body had been another's, to him too had been the affections attributed. But if the flesh is the words, for the word became flesh, of necessity then the affections also of the flesh are ascribed to him whose the flesh is. 
and to whom the affections are ascribed, such namely as to be condemned, to be scourged, to thirst, and the cross, and death, and the other infirmities of the body, of him too is the triumph and the grace. For this cause, then, consistently and fittingly, such affections are ascribed not to another, but to the Lord, that the grace also may be from him, and that we may become not worshippers of any other, but truly devout towards God, because we invoke no originate thing, no ordinary man, but the natural and true Son from God, who has become man, yet is not the less Lord and God the Saviour. End quote. Since Cyril quoted this passage from Athanasius in defending his twelfth anathema, from Nicaea on, it had been made clear that creature worship was intolerable to orthodoxy, and from the earliest beginnings of the church, worship of Christ as man was anathema. St. Epiphanius in Ancoratus, section 50, declared bowing an act of religious service, and therefore a prerogative of God, it cannot be given to man, quote, and let them not vainly heap up blasphemies to themselves, for if the Son is a creature, he is not to be bowed to, for it is foolish to bow to a creature and to do away the first commandment. End quote. Epiphanius, in writing on the Ereomaniacs, Heresy 64, section 31, accused the Arians of making an idol of Christ, in that Christ was for them a mere creature whom they made into a false god, a created god, when the only true god is the uncreated and triune god. Quote, is then even the soul born so judged among you and do ye think so disgracefully in regard to him who redeemed you, since indeed he did redeem you? But ye are no longer of his fold, for ye deny your Saviour and Redeemer. For if he is not real God, then he is not to be bowed to, and if he is a creature, he is not God. And if he is not to be bowed to, why then is he called God? Cease ye to work out the Babylonian nature again, for ye have set up the likeness and the image of Nebuchadnezzar, and have sounded that much talked of trumpet to gather the warriors, and with music and cymbals and stringed instruments ye have made the peoples to fall by means of your deceptive words, for ye have got them to serve an image rather than God and truth. And what other is real, God, as the Son of God is? End quote. Nestorius could not rightfully accuse the Orthodox party of introducing an innovation. From the beginning, creature worship had been opposed, the unity without confusion upheld. In his answer, however, he persisted in ascribing Apollinarianism to Cyril and the Council and in denying the Incarnation. The Nestorian counter-anathema 4 read, quote, If anyone understands as though they belong to but one nature those expressions in the Gospels and the Apostolic Epistles which were written concerning Christ, who is of two natures, and tries to ascribe the sufferings of flesh as well as of divinity also to the word himself of God, let him be anathema. End quote. The fifth anathema stated, quote, If anyone dares to say that the anointed one is an inspired man and not rather that he is really God as being the one son by his divine nature, for as much as the word was made flesh and like us shared blood and flesh, let him be anathema. End quote. Nestorius's counter anathema 5 read, quote, If anyone ventures to say that, even after the assumption of human nature, there is one Son of God, he who is so in nature, while he, since the assumption of flesh, is certainly Emmanuel, let him be anathema. End quote. The implication, again, is that the alternative is between Nestorius's moral union or a monophysite position. The sixth anathema declared, quote, If anyone dares to say that the word who came out of God the Father is God or Master of the Anointed One, and does not rather confess that the same one is both God and man together, for as much as the word has been made flesh according to the Scriptures, let him be anathema, end quote. The sixth Nestorian counter-anathema read, quote, 
If anyone, after the Incarnation, calls another than Christ the Word and ventures to say that the form of a servant is equally with the Word of God, without beginning and uncreated, and not rather that it is made by him as its natural Lord and Creator and God, and that he has promised to raise it again in the words, quote, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it again, end quote. Let him be anathema, end quote. Nestorius here assumed that his opponents held to a transubstantiation of Christ's human nature into the substance of God the Word. Moreover, he assumed that the human nature came not from the Virgin Mary, but directly from God, and was without beginning and therefore uncreated flesh. For Nestorius, there could be no primacy of God in the Incarnation without a destruction of man. Hence, he denied the Incarnation in favour of conjunction or moral union to retain primacy for man. Cyril's Anathema 6 and 7 condemned, first, the Nestorian opinion that Christ was simply an inspired man, not God of God, and that Christ was simply energised by the Holy Spirit. Second, Cyril condemned the transfer of the glory of God, the Word, to Jesus as man. In the seventh anathema, Cyril declared, quote, If anyone says that Jesus, as being a mere man, was merely energised by God the Word, and that the glory of the soul-born has been put about him, that mere man as being another besides the soul-born Word himself, let him be anathema, end quote. The Nestorian Counter-Anathema 7 reads, quote, If anyone says that the man who was formed of the Virgin is the only begotten who was born from the bosom of the Father before the morning star was, Psalm 109.3, and does not rather confess that he has obtained the designation of only begotten on account of his connection with him, who in nature is the only begotten of the Father, and besides, if anyone calls another than the Emmanuel, Christ, let him be anathema. End quote. The charge again is of the transubstantiation of the humanity of Christ into the deity. Nestorius read the doctrine of economic appropriation as transubstantiation. Nestorius had an implicit doctrine of economic appropriation of another sort. For him, first, God could not become incarnate. Second, all attributes appearing on the scene of time and history had to be economically appropriated, therefore, by man, since man is the primary agent in time and history. Third, it follows, therefore, that whatever of God appears on the human scene in time and history must be appropriated by man, because by definition it cannot be God incarnate or God primarily, but God in moral union with man as the prime agent. The eighth anathema of Cyril and the council declared, quote, If anyone shall dare to say that the assumed man ought to be worshipped together with God the Word, and glorified together with him, and recognised together with him as God, and yet as two different things, the one with the other, for this, quote, together with, end quote, is added, that is, by the Nestorians, to convey this meaning, and shall not rather with one adoration worship the Emmanuel and pay to him one glorification, as it is written, quote, The word was made flesh, end quote, let him be anathema, end quote. In worshipping the Son, we worship therefore not his humanity, but his deity only. When we are forbidden to worship the humanity of God incarnate, it follows necessarily that all creature worship and bowing to any creature in worship is absolutely forbidden. As a result, the council was clearly opposed to the veneration of Mary and the saints and felt that it had created a theological barrier to all creature worship. The Nestorian counter-anathema, it, stated, quote, If anyone says that the form of a servant should, for its own sake, that is, in reference to its own nature, be reverenced, and that it is the ruler of all things, and not rather that merely on account of its connection with the holy and in itself universally ruling nature of the only begotten, it is to be reverenced, let him be anathema. End quote. Here Nestorius ostensibly renounces creature worship by declaring that those who say that the Christ is ruler of all things and to be worshipped are wrong. For Nestorius, Christ is to be worshipped or reverenced although a man, on account of his, quote, connection, end quote, with God. 
Thus, Christ for Nestorius cannot be worshipped as God, but he can be worshipped as a man connected with God. As St. Cyril in one of his works observed, quote, God alone is free and absolute, for, so to speak, he demands tribute from all and, so to speak, receives worship as due from all. And if Christ be the end of the law and the prophets, Romans 10.4, but is a mere inspired man, may we not say that the end of the prophetic predictions has brought the crime of worshipping a man to us? End quote. This same subject was dealt with by the Fifth Ecumenical Council, A.D. 553, in its Anathema 9, which declared, quote, If anyone says that the Anointed One is to be bowed to in two natures, by which two worships are brought in, one peculiar to God the Word and another peculiar to the man, but will not bow to God the Word enfleshed within his own flesh, with but one worship as the Church of God has received from the beginning, let such a one be Anathema, End quote. The ninth anathema declared, quote, If any man shall say that the one Lord Jesus Christ was glorified by the Holy Ghost, so that he used through him a power not his own, and from him received power against unclean spirits and power to work miracles before man, and shall not rather confess that it was his own spirit through which he worked these divine signs, let him be anathema. End quote. The counter-anathema 9 of Nestorius read, quote, If anyone says that the form of a servant is of like nature with the Holy Ghost, and not rather that it owes its union with the Word which has existed since the conception, to his mediation by which it works miraculous healings among men, and possesses the power of expelling demons, let him be anathema. End quote. Crystal summarized the three views as to worshipping the humanity of Christ very ably. For the Nestorians, quote, Both natures in Christ are to be worshipped, his divinity absolutely, his humanity relatively only. Each nature is separate, and yet the worship to both is to be united, end quote. The Monophysites came to hold that, quote, There is only one nature in Christ since the union, that is, the divine, and it alone is to be worshipped. But the Orthodox reply that, in fact, however, Christ's human nature does remain, and therefore, in worshipping all of Christ as God absolutely, the one naturite was, in fact, a creature worshipper. The Orthodox held that quote, One only of Christ's two natures is to be worshipped, that is, the divinity, and that absolutely. As an old writer puts it, quote, there are two natures in Christ, one divine and to be bowed to, and one human and not to be bowed to, end quote. The issue with respect to the Holy Spirit was a related one. Christ declared in John 16, 14 and 15 that, quote, All things that the Father hath are mine, end quote. The Holy Ghost therefore proceeding from the Father as from the Son, for Nestorius, therefore, instead of God incarnate working miracles by his own spirit, a man works miracles through his moral command over the spirit. Cyril condemned the opinion that a merely human Christ worked miracles and reserved that power to the incarnate Son of God by his own spirit. In the Tenth Anathema, Cyril and the Council dealt with the work of Christ as mediator and saviour. Quote, Whoever shall say that it is not the divine word himself when he was made flesh and had become a man as we are, but another than he, a man born of a woman, yet different from him who is become our great high priest and apostle, or if any man shall say that he offered himself in sacrifice for himself and not rather for us, whereas being without sin he had no need of offering or sacrifice, let him be anathema, end quote. The counter-anathema 10 of Nestorius read, quote, If anyone maintains that the Word, who is from the beginning, has become the high priest and apostle of our confession, and has offered himself for us, and does not rather say that it is the work of Emmanuel to be an apostle, and if anyone in such a manner divides the sacrifice between him who united, the Word, and him who was united, the manhood, referring it to a common sonship, that is, not giving to God that which is God's, and to man that which is man's, let him be anathema. End quote. 
God the Word is our mediator, not a mere man. To open the door as Nestorius did to man was to allow also any creature, saints, angels or martyrs to become mediators, and St. Cyril emphasised this in his five-book contradiction of the blasphemies of Nestorius, book 111, section 103. Nestorius made mediation the work of man. Salvation thus became man's work, not God's grace. The orthodox doctrine of economic appropriation reserved unto God the ultimacy, primacy, authority and activity in all things. The Nestorian doctrine of economic appropriation reserved unto man the ultimacy, primacy, authority and activity in all things, and to add insult to injury, claimed to do it in defence of God's glory. In the Confessions of the Reformation, the long subverted orthodox doctrine of mediation was restored and made central. The eleventh anathema of Cyril and the Council declared, quote, Whosoever shall not confess that the flesh of the Lord giveth life, and that it pertains to the word of God the Father as his very own, but shall pretend that it belongs to another person who is united to him, that is, the word, only according to honour, and who has served as a dwelling for the divinity, and shall not rather confess, as we say, that the flesh giveth life, because it is that of the word who giveth life to all, let him be anathema. End quote. The historian Counter Anathema 11 read, quote, If anyone maintains that the flesh which is united with God the Word is by the power of its own nature life giving, whereas the Lord himself says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. St. John 6 64, let him be anathema. End quote. The reference here is to the sacrament of communion. St. Cyril had made it clear in his teachings that his position was not consubstantiation and transubstantiation, as they came to be called later. Moreover, in the elements, it is not the substance of the deity of Christ which is received, nor is it the eating and drinking of Christ's real blood and flesh. The idolatry of worshipping Christ's deity or humanity in the elements was also barred, the anathema condemned those who held that mere human flesh and blood can spiritually quicken anyone when it is the word that quickens us in the Eucharist by his life-giving spirit. To receive mere flesh and blood, Cyril taught, spiritually quickens no one, and to eat flesh and to drink blood is cannibalism and wickedness. The Nestorians held to a real presence of the human flesh and blood of Christ, although the Nestorians denied it. Cyril, however, did not accept that denial as valid. The twelfth anathema of Cyril and the council declared, quote, Whoever shall not recognize that the word of God suffered in the flesh, that he was crucified in the flesh, and that likewise in that same flesh he tasted death, and that he has become the first begotten of the dead, for, as he is God, he is the life, and it is he that giveth life, let him be anathema. End quote. The Nestorian counter-anathema 12, as usual, declared its humanism in the name of preserving the dignity of God. Quote, if anyone, in confessing the sufferings of the flesh, ascribe these also to the word of God as to the flesh in which he appeared, and thus does not distinguish the dignity of the natures, let him be anathema. End quote. Here again, it is the reality of the incarnation and the doctrine of economic appropriation which is at stake. Nestorius's counter-anathema is aimed at these doctrines. Not only was the doctrine affirmed by the Third Council, but the Fourth Ecumenical Council gave sanction to the term economic appropriation by approving St. Cyril's, quote, Epistle to John of Antioch, end quote, which read in part, quote, And moreover, we all confess that the Word of God is not liable to suffering, even though he himself, in all wisely managing the mystery of redemption, is seen to ascribe to himself the sufferings which happened to his own flesh. And for that very reason, the all-wise Peter saith, Christ then hath suffered for us in the flesh, 1 Peter 4.1, and not in the nature of the ineffable divinity. For in order that he himself may be believed to be the saviour of all, he refers the sufferings of his own flesh to himself by economic appropriation. 
I think implying that doctrine is what was predicted through the prophetic utterances as from himself. I gave my back to scourges and my cheeks to blows and I turned not away my face from the spittings of shame. Isaiah 56, end quote. Thus, while the deity did not in itself suffer by economic appropriation, suffering is attributed to it. Theodotus, Bishop of Ancyra, in reporting on Nestorius's answer to the final summons, had said, quote, I am indeed pained for my friend. Nevertheless, I honour piety before any friendship. End quote. The council was not marked by personal hostility to Nestorius. It was marked by concern for the Orthodox faith. And Nestorius, by his arrogant dismissal of it, brought on his condemnation, quote, namely, that our Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has blasphemed, decrees by the Holy Synod that Nestorius be excluded from the Episcopal dignity and from all priestly communion, end quote. The council had been patient with the man, though hostile to the heresy. Although the emperor favoured Nestorius, he was finally excluded from office. Angelo of Ephesus was convened, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, was to have presided, but he died in the latter part of 430. The council, however, accomplished something very important to Augustine. Pelagianism was condemned, or, in the words of the Synod Report, quote, Pelagians and Celestians, end quote, referring to Celestius, a follower of Pelagius, were condemned. Pelagius, a monk born in Britain, made salvation a matter of man's moral works, not of God's grace. Percival's comment is apt, quote, The only grace which he would admit the existence of was what we may call external grace. For example, the example of Christ, the teaching of his ministers and the like, end quote. This was open humanism. Pelagius and Celestius had found refuge with Nestorius, bringing their heresies together. Earlier, the Bishop of Rome had seen no heresy in Nestorius, but the work of the Orthodox theologians led by Cyril, Augustine and others steadily alerted the Church to these heresies. Canon 4 of Ephesus stated, quote, If any of the clergy shall fall away and publicly or privately presume to maintain the doctrines of Nestorius or Celestius, it is declared just by the Holy Synod that these also should be deposed, end quote. Pelagianism had already been condemned in the West, and Ephesus, therefore, did not enter into the details of the issue as it did with Nestorianism. Moreover, Nestorius having been condemned, the heresies he sheltered were also struck down. The 200 bishops who met at Ephesus had done an important work. The council was bitterly contested, and its history subsequently is a complex one of contested authority. Modern scholars have often been apologists for Nestorius. Chalcedon, however, confirmed Ephesus and the false council of Ephesus of 449. The robber council was condemned. At the robber council, many bishops were not allowed a voice in the meeting, dominated by Eutychus's patron, Diocursus of Alexandria, who induced the emperor Theodosius II to convoke the meeting. Dioscurus was supposedly Cyril's follower, but in reality a Monophysite and a leader of that party. For the Monophysites, the divine was emphasised. They denied that there were two natures after the Incarnation, and even the body of Christ was a divine body. The human attributes were all transferred to the, quote, humanised Logos, end quote. In Schaff's words, Eutychus, quote, asserted therefore, on the one hand, the capability of suffering and death in the Logos personality, and on the other hand, the deification of the human in Christ. End quote. This was humanism in the name of anti humanism. Humanity was ascribed into the Trinity in the name of God centered religion. In the place of economic appropriation, the Monophysites held to the real absorption of humanity into divinity. Dioscurus presided and ruled with the aid of violent monks and armed soldiers. The form of orthodoxy was maintained by adopting the twelve anathematisms of Cyril, whereas in reality another doctrine was affirmed. The two-nature diophysite faith was condemned, as Flavianus, its champion, was condemned. 
The proconsul Plotlus, with armed soldiers and change, entered to compel the bishops to sign. After severe violence, ninety-six of them did, with many severely wounded. Flavianus, bishop of Constantinople, died within three days of the injuries he received. It was said that the monks kicked him savagely, and Dioscurus jumped on Flavianus as he lay upon the ground. The robber council gained a savage and oppressive short-term victory, but it stood self-condemned by its disgraceful conduct. The victories of the true council of Ephesus were hammered out in the arena of faith, of consistent theological thinking. The victories of the false council rested on violence and were short-lived. Within two years, Chalcedon had denounced them, but before then, the opinion of all true Christians had condemned the council of robbers. The Ecumenical Council of Ephesus accomplished a very important and yet difficult task. It affirmed the reality of the Incarnation and the primacy of God the Son in that Incarnation. This subtle point was a crucial one. The humanists saw clearly how Christianity could be converted into humanism. First, the reality of the Incarnation could be denied, as Nestorius denied it. Second, the Incarnation could be affirmed, but the humanity of Jesus Christ could be given priority over his divinity. If, in the Incarnation, the humanity gained ascendancy and control over the divinity, then humanity would be introduced into a position of eternal power and determination over God. Time would then govern eternity, and man would rule over God. While nominally affirming a central doctrine of the faith, Such a doctrine of the affirmation of the Incarnation would actually be an affirmation of humanism, of man. By pressure against the faith at this point, the humanists would be ostensibly affirming the reality of the Incarnation against orthodox mistreatment of it. The defence of the faith dealt obviously with an extremely subtle point, which, however crucial, would seem to the simple and unlearned to be merely theological hair-splitting. To this day, the doctrine of economic appropriation has remained an almost forgotten victory. It remains, however, a necessary victory. Against the renewed onslaughts of humanism, there can be no sure defence of the faith apart from the armour of Scripture and its defenders at Ephesus.